now it's your turn. Do it live! On News Talk 1430 KASI. This is the afternoon. It is your turn on News Talk 1430 KASI. I have decided to wear a stick for the rest of the program. All right, you take the mental picture. You're welcome. It is your turn on News Talk. Whenever he does, joining us on the newsmaker line right now, Iowa State University political science professor Stephen Schmidt. Hey, professor, good afternoon. Well, that's pretty rowdy music there. We're rocking it. That's how we. Yeah, I'm not used to that. I'm an academic. Yeah, we we bring it strong. Yep. Which is not true because. I remember, uh, I remember calling the professor's office a few years ago, and he said to me, and I'm quoting now, hold on a second, I've got to turn down my music. <laughs> and his music was, you were living La Vida Loca, professor, if I remember correctly. That's right. I have some awesome speakers here, and every once in a while I just really make the walls shake and the books fall off the shelf. And at Hamilton Hall, in a big old building like that, when you can make the wall shake, yeah. you may be doing structural damage. It's Ross Hall, but who's oh. who's counting? Well, same big old building, then. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It is a big old, big old building. <coughs> yes, sir. What can I do for you? Well, hold on a second. I've got to see if I can't cough up a lung here. Do you want me to talk a little bit about the budget uh, crisis and Obama and the Republicans at each other's throats? Let's talk about that in a little bit. But first, let's talk about what I want to talk about. Which is, <laughs> you seem to be either coughing or dying, so... Well, that's how I roll. Um, Mike Glover, uh, Associated Press writer for the state of Iowa, writes a story picked up by the Washington Post this week. The headline, Conservative GOP could prompt some to skip Iowa. Mr. Glover's assertion in the story is that because of what he detects as a rightward shift in the state's Republican Party, that uh, having a Republican presidential candidate like Mitt Romney come through Iowa in 2012 and drop $10 million in this state is probably not going to happen again. And the story, kind of writ large, also questions whether Iowa should maintain its first-in-the-nation status if we are going to see at least the Republican caucus being dominated by the most conservative people in the state. Let's remember Mitt Romney dropped $10 million in this state. He put two, 200 people on his payroll in Iowa to finish second to Mike Huckabee. So does, does Glover make a point here, Professor? What do you think? Nah. All right. Thanks. Uh, we'll talk again. Okay, we'll see you next week. Thanks. Look, look, um, coming in second for Mitt Romney in Iowa was very good. And as I recall, neither Huckabee nor Mitt Romney got the nomination. For that. And the guy that never came to Iowa is the guy who got the nomination because McCain skipped it. And so I, I think that there is something to the fact that if the activists in states like Iowa and New Hampshire and South Carolina, let's say those are the first three uh, caucus and primary states, um, choose someone who is too hot, too sizzling hot for the majority of voters in that party in the rest of the country, then we won't have much of an impact. So, you know, uh, Iowa Republicans have moved very far to the right, and if they dominate the caucuses, they could very well pick someone. Let's say that they picked uh, Michelle Bachman or Sarah Palin. That probably would uh, mean that the Iowa caucuses did not choose the winner or one of the top three nationally because I think uh, even though that person might win in Iowa, they probably wouldn't do so well in the Republican primaries in the rest of the country. Um, the Democrats also can't afford to pick too sizzling hot a lefty in, in the Iowa caucuses when, when they're doing their job because... For the same reason, you know, that, okay. you know, you want to go on and you've got to get somebody nominated, first of all, by the party activists in the rest of the country. And then step two, and I've, I've, I've written about this in InsiderIowa.com. There are a bunch of articles and I did a blog the other day, a video blog, so you can actually see me spouting off and the hot air coming right out of my mouth, um, saying that, um, 
you know, the, the party can either go ideological and then it, it will stick with principles and with the faith of the, of the faithful, but then they probably won't win either the nomination or if they choose the, the person who is that sizzling hot, they probably won't win the general election because you and I have talked about this and your listeners are very smart people. I run into them all the time. Uh, in in all kinds of places, and they 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 love your show, by the way. But secondly, they uh, understand that the independents, the no party people, the un unaffiliated, in the end, in November uh, of two thousand and twelve, are the ones who are going to deliver the the, the presidency, well, and they are not going to go for someone who is too conservative. And you made the point uh, on the program before. Uh, you can hold to your ideology. You can stick to the courage of your conviction, and, you know, if you don't mind losing, uh, you can do that. Yep. Uh, apparently, you know, there are going to be some times at which you may have to, uh, if not take a position that you're not comfortable with, at least not rail against it from the top of the mountain. Um, Iowa social conservatives who have, I, think, I remember even going back to 1988 when they gave... Um, uh, oh, and I can't remember his name. It wasn't Buchanan that took second place in 1988. Uh, Pat Robertson yeah. took second place yeah. in Iowa in 1988 behind the guy who didn't win the presidency. Right. Um, so, you know, like, is this a recent phenomenon? No. It's not. That's that's very a very good point. You've got that historical perspective, and, and that really helps your listeners because... This stuff, you know, it doesn't just come up. It's it's part of a, a process. And you'll remember that when Goldwater was able to get the nomination, he did horribly in the general election. And when McGovern uh, got the support of very liberal Democrats, the same thing happened to him that happened to Goldwater. And so there's a choice to be made. And I'll be Professor Schmidt for a second, okay? Hold on, I'm going to write this down. Okay. Go ahead, go ahead. All right, and there'll be quiz, a quiz, you know, later. Um <laughs> There are what we call parties of principle, and those are parties that always stick with the actual philosophical and ideological principles of their beliefs about morality and the economy and other things, um, in, you know, regardless of the consequences in the more general political process. So those are called parties of principle. And then there are what are called more pragmatic parties. And those are parties that adjust their principles so that they are not too far out of line with the principles of the majority or plurality of Americans around the country, as uh, this is for presidential elections. The Republicans stand a chance of now becoming more a party of principle, where they will not compromise on the things that they feel strongly and passionately about. And that's, that's commendable. But parties of principle in the United States, hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm, almost, I'm still right. They never win elections. No, they don't. And the reason is that, you know, they, the, the rest of the country doesn't buy into the principles if they are too clear cut. The, you know, most Americans, you know, have a variety of different priorities. And if you put social conservative issues at the top of the agenda, you may find that a majority of Americans have some other issue that they are interested in. If you want to put budget cuts and, and, and really essentially reaming out um, the, the budgets of states and of the federal government, um, a majority of Americans may say, let's, let's put this on a glide path and glide to a soft landing on budgets and not take a chainsaw and cut off the branch that we're sitting on. And so that becomes an enormous um, issue because if the Republicans insist on, uh, you know, the purity of their position on these issues, they'll, they'll probably lose the general election. And, so, well, uh, you know, and, and that's just the reality of it. Well, and that's just it. I mean, you can, um, you have to decide <clears throat> what do you want more? Do you want to be able to sleep comfortably at night with all of your convictions and closely held beliefs in place? That's right. Or do you want to win elections? And exactly. I'm sorry, but those are the decisions, and not just for people on the social right, yeah. but also people on the liberal left, as you mentioned. Exactly right. And, and you know, I have several friends. I have um, my, my dear friend, uh, Arnie Arneson. She's a woman, not a man, even though the name is Arnie. 
um, she has actually a different name, but Arnie is the name she uses, is a passionate liberal and, and wants Obama to take a very liberal, hardcore position on issues. And whenever I'm on a radio show with her or on a forum or some kind of a thing, we do some public speaking together, I just have to, you know, cut her off at the knees because, you know, if Obama were to take a real hardcore left liberal position, and, hey, Republicans, he's not taking a hardcore liberal left position. In fact, he is basically meeting the Republicans more than halfway um, on a lot of issues. For example, the, the, you know, the, the Bush tax cuts and other things. If he took a position that was really hard left liberal, he, he would lose and the and the Democrats would lose even more than they've lost. So, you know, the United States is a country where still, and I think it's a good thing, kind of pragmatism rules. And the the majority of Americans, when they when you put all of their views and opinions together, it comes out to kind of a an an, an average, right? Sure. Well, I mean, it's the age old, age old analogy. You're running for a primary. You're going to run to the right or run to the left. Right. If you win. Everybody races toward the middle. Yes, but you can because very good. You're in the mushy middle. Say what you want about us of being about being mushy and fence sitters and the like. That's all fine. But we're just going to go ahead and make all the decisions. And and you can run to the left if you're a Democrat, um, because you know the Democratic Party activists are more liberal than most Americans. And you can run to the right if you're a Republican. Most Republicans are more conservative than you know, the total number of voters that are going to turn up in November. But if you go too far to the left or too far to the right, then you end up essentially uh, driving off and scaring off enough people that you can't run to the center again in November. Um, and, and, and that's just the way it is. And you can hold up your placard that says no more compromises, but you can also put in parentheses underneath that and no more winning either. Well, that's right. I mean, you you run the risk. Now, the Republicans did remarkably well this in 2010. But remarkably it, well. It wasn't, but you, know. you, you certainly are more versed in this than I am, but just like in 2008, as it was in 2010, oh. they weren't voting for people. They were voting against people. Yes, and, and, and the Republicans have decided that they had a certain mandate and when I look at why people voted for Republicans, what the Republicans think the mandate was isn't what why people were voting for. And so you got to be very careful not to misinterpret the mandate you got and then push policies that actually people say, no, 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 that's not what we voted about. And so, you know, that's, that's the risk. And in the case of Iowa, my friend... Um, the Republicans in, in Des Moines are, um, and it isn't necessarily the whole party, but their individual Republicans are pushing some issues that they feel strongly about that don't have the support of a vast majority of people in the state in terms of how far um, these folks are going on those issues. And we can talk about, you know, where you can carry a gun. We can talk about um, how much you should restrict abortion and, you know, all those kinds of things, because those are some of those issues. But, and if they insist on pushing those issues, and, and I understand, you know, people who are pro-life have a profound passion and a moral commitment to um, opposing abortion. Um, the problem is that they are pushing a, a commitment that is based on their faith-based moral values. And it may be that others, even though others may be Christians and may be Jews and maybe you know other other religious faiths, um, don't have you know a position that is that um, let's call it clear cut on an issue like abortion. If you ban all abortions in Iowa, I think a lot of people are going to say, "Wow, you know somebody gets raped um, and and just you know does not want to carry that." Um, you know, that uh, a child or somebody, um, you know, has incest committed on them. On. You know, those are issues where pe a lot of people feel, you know. Yes, sir. Thank you for staying with us.
through the break again. Uh, they've got uh, flash flood warning for southern Polk and southern Dallas counties on the, along the Raccoon River. Uh, some ice jam flooding today. We're getting on an ice jam. Woo! This is low six out, everybody. Uh, it is your turn on News Talk 14. Good to say, hey, uh, bye. Too glad we don't have a camera in this studio. Because that's out of the way. So it means the answer meant the ice jam. Anyway, still with us, at least I pray. Yep, yeah, you're uh, right here. University political science professor. Stephen Schmidt, are you still there? Or are Get her done. Get out the ice jam. Get her done. I, I'm going to ice jam tonight. They're playing at the maintenance shop at the Memorial Union. So that's yeah, awesome. that's right. Yeah. Um, so here, the president uh, releases his uh, budget, a three trillion huh. with a T trillion dollar budget. And here's a little secret. And who didn't see this one coming? The Republicans don't like it. They say shocking. It spends too much money and doesn't cut enough spending. Wow. Who didn't see that coming? Well, that's right. I mean, uh, we have a problem. We have two different visions of how you deal with the United States in a in a big picture way. One is that budget um, deficits and the federal debt are the biggest problem the country has, and we have to deal with those immediately and and really in a in a serious and severe way. And that would mean enormous budget cuts. Um, it would mean budget cuts, by the way, for Social Security, but probably not Social Security. It would mean adjustments of Social Security with, you know, maybe raising the retirement age and jiggling around some of the benefits. Because Social Security is in pretty good shape, you know. We all work, those of us who work, and are paying into that thing. And the people who are retired are taking out. And now we are taking out a little more than we're paying in, so we need to rebalance it. But that's not a big problem. But Medicare, Medicaid, and the uh, military spending are the are the you know enormous three big gorillas in the house and you know the republicans don't want to cut from any of those programs but they want giant budget cuts and they want president obama to do those all right they want him to put stick his head out of the window of a fast moving train and say we got to balance the budget i'm going to cut all of these programs which are very popular with americans president obama says no way jose because if we're going to do some tough things, we're going to do them together. And Democrats and Republicans are going to have to come together, and we're going to have to hold hands and say, we're together on this. This is not a political issue. It's not us versus them, me versus you, but it's we, we got to do some things here, and we both will take the political hits from it equally. And unless that happens, nothing is going to happen. So Obama says we can't slash the budgets and, and federal spending as drastically as the Republicans would like because we're in a fragile recovery and if we do that we're going to basically pour a, a big bucket of water on the little you know when you try to start a fire in your fireplace with some paper and some other stuff and you light it and there's that little flame you don't want to pour water on that on that because you're not going to get a fire and so he says let's do some budget cuts but there are some areas where we need to invest and we want to develop technology and move ahead and so the idea is the Republicans view it as we're gluttonous and spending too much. We need to cut it and go on a diet. Obama says we need to f uh, finish the recovery and we need to invest in the future as well. We, we, if we just cut budgets, we're going to lose competitiveness. And between those two things, you know, there's a big gap. And so they're going to have to figure out a way how to bring together those two philosophies. It's a philosophical difference, well, really. What's fascinating to me about the whole thing, with uh, with three minutes left, and I've you know if this is going to sound like a partisan statement, I yep. don't intend it to. Yeah. But here it is anyway. It is fascinating to me that we we got really powerfully concerned about the size of the federal deficit and the national debt on January twenty first, two thousand nine. We what? really didn't care about it a whole lot before that, as we were passing along tax breaks and we were, uh, you know, getting ourselves involved in two land wars in, in uh, the Middle East. We didn't really care about it then. January 21st, 2009, boy howdy, we're not going to let you spend the way the riches of our grandchildren, Mr. President. Uh, the thing is, they're continuing to sell that story, and the American people are still continuing to kind of buy it. Well, I I don't know that that's true. I think the American people are confused. I think the American people are want to hear 
uh, explanations of how can we continue to, you know, patch up those potholes, which, you know, they're getting pretty big. I mean, I had to put another tire size on my SUVs in order to get through those things. Uh, we, our air traffic control system, our infrastructure, you know, we're falling behind uh, Europe and China and other countries. So how can we keep up and remain the United States of America and at the same time do it in a way that, you know, kind of makes us uh, pay for things as we go along and 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 can we do that like over the next 10 years and actually land safely or do we have to actually just plunge the airplane straight down at the runway right now and I think Americans want to hear that that's what the 2012 election is going to be about Trent yeah. this is exactly it's how do we get from here where we are where we really don't want to be to over there where we know that that's you know where the United States should be and it's going to be a rough ride there are a lot of thunderstorms in there professor we as always appreciate it your insight is valuable uh, we will talk again next week sir thank you very much great talking to you Iowa State University